So let's go over the wastewater treatment process. These plants are everywhere. Every city has them and even Disney World in Florida. Even large truck stops are required to have them because they need to process liquid coming out of uh, all the restaurants and facilities. They usually have large tanks and there are some are spherical, uh, some are uh, uh, square, some are rectangular. Uh, we have plants that are built on islands. We have plants that are built out in deserts. And of course, in New York City, we have one that's actually on a platform in the East River, which is covered by a park. This is inadvertently called, rather intentionally called, the water treatment plant. But it's not water they're treating, it's wastewater. These plants generally have the following common features. Well, water f feeds into these plants usually by gravity flow, but then you have to pump it through the process. So it is a pump house that pumps water through a bar screen. And in the bar screen, large debris like branches and cans and even body parts and dogs and turtles and alligators would get filtered out. I'll go over each one of these in more detail in a second. Then we have a sedimentation tank for the solids to fall to the bottom. Solids that don't fall to the bottom are oxidized in an, in an aeration tank. And then material is disinfectant before thrown into the river. But now you have a lot of solids. And these solids have a complete different process. And there you have a clarifier that thickens the solids, and then the solids are digested, meaning they're consumed. Finally, the solids have to go somewhere, and usually they become landfill material and used as fertilizers. There are many, many different flow charts on the web for this. Each one is slightly different, but there are commonalities. So I encourage you to Google around and find different uh, process flows for wastewater treatment. Not water treatment, wastewater treatment. Here's another one showing the primary and secondary process. So where does water come, wastewater come from? Well, we said it before. It comes from homes, businesses, but also street runoff. And this is called influent. What flows into the treatment plant is influent. There are three processes out there. The primary treatment process, which essentially collects screen materials and solids. Then the secondary, which does everything the primary, but it also oxidizes dissolved organics. And of course, there's some sludge digestion. Finally, out in the world, we do have plants that literally take sewage, human sewage, wastewater, and completely reprocess it, removing everything from solids to dissolved solids to sludges to nitrogen and pathogens and render it drinkable. There are actually plants in the U.S. that are processing human waste water and turning it into potable drinking water. Now, where does this water come from? Well, it comes from homes and travels to the plants and sewers. Sewers are quite famous, and there are many images and movie scenes shot in uh, sewers, including the famous Paris sewers, and you can get tours of these places. They're large containers, which are rather quiet, except when there's a heavy rainstorm. Then these things are, become raging rivers. We have to make sure the sewers stay clean and there's an active force out there cleaning the sewers and making sure when it rains water does flow into these containments and to the treatment plants. And of course is the always the alligator in the sewage in the sewer. And of course yes, alligators can live there. However, it's dark, it's cold, the food source is so-so, there are plenty of rats there. But basically, these are cold-blooded animals that really don't find sewers very hospitable. So while an alligator may survive a couple of months in a sewer, they are not thriving. Now, once the water goes into these sewers, the first process is screening. And here you see bar screens where water is racing through these bars at a fairly fast clip, and everything gets picked up of a certain size. Sticks, paper, money, cans and unfortunately years ago body parts as well as an occasional uh, 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 
metal or coin. The water is flowing through the screens in narrow channels and these combs are cleaning the uh, uh, these screens and then people are raking whatever falls in onto a tray into a drum for disposal. Remember what we're doing is systematically removing material. So now the water coming into this tank, this grit tank, does not have paper, does not have sticks, does not have cans. But the water in this tank is slowed down just enough so that solids can settle out. Sand. Pretty heavy stuff, including rice and grit. And sure enough, rice is quite heavy. Its specific gravity is higher than water, so that in water, rice would actually settle. This is actually a different degritting process that use, uses a uh, centrifuge of sorts to degrit. Once the water in the tank is uh, slowed down, the grit falls to the bottom, and you could see a uh, clamshell crane that will go into the tank and scoop up this material and collect it. This is very inorganic. It's essentially sand and rocks and large particles. It's not organic. Uh, there's not much organic matter to it. Then the water goes into a long, quiet tank. It could take a couple of hours for water to go through this tank from one end to the other. It's very quiet. And that means solids can settle and things that float can come to the top. And sure enough, if you look at a tank empty, you'll see that these slats are pushing the solids one way and pushing the floatables another way. And this is systematically collecting what's called settable solids. Here's a better picture of these slats. There's one ready to go under water. The slats are going from the bottom of the screen to the top. And they're pushing the organics, in this case the floatables, into this one section where someone will come and rake it into that pipe. Then of course on the bottom the slats are pushing the heavier solids into another pipe. These floatables are quite noxious. It's oils, fats, grease, condoms, floatables, any plastic is in this tank. This tank is eight feet deep. You can imagine what it smells like in a hot summer day. But a worker comes and grabs the material, puts it into a container, and off it goes into a landfill. But it's pretty good stuff. Bacon grease is very organic and a fairly strong fertilizer and nutrient. So it's mixed in with soil and does produce good biodegradability. So now you have water that has no paper, cans, no floatable material, no settable material, but it's got a lot of dissolved organics, such as starch. Just think of what leaves your house. All that murky liquid after you wash your dishes has a lot of protein, fats, and of course carbohydrates. And if you bubble air through this uh, mixture, you're stimulating biodegradability and the bacteria go nuts and fungi and they grow and they grow and they grow and they consume BOD. Remember that phrase? That's what's happening in this tank. It could take four hours for the water to go from the bottom to the top. Each, uh, and during that travel, it's actually uh, biologically decaying. The, uh, the fats and the carbohydrates are being consumed. They're being eaten alive by the bacteria. Here's what the tank looks like empty because you need to provide plenty of oxygen for this to happen. If you don't pump oxygen in, it's going to go septic very, very quickly. And of course, on a Saturday morning, this is what you get. Everybody runs to do their laundry, and you have excessive surfactants, and you have foaming. This can get dangerous because it can produce a slippery surface. And notice in this uh, photograph, which is quite old, there are no guard guardrails. Another tank is a trickling filter. So instead of bubbling air through a tank for biodegradation, you are actually allowing bacteria to grow on a media. So these rocks have bacterial cultures and fungal cultures growing around them. And as the water goes over the rocks with the bacterial cultures, they consume, they eat the uh, carbohydrates in that water. 
So trickling filters are doing the same thing as an aeration tank. Once water comes out of the aeration tank, you have to let it settle and also material can flow to the top. So these are the secondary settling tanks. Now the stuff that settles out at the bottom of this tank has a lot of bacteria in it and it's good feed for the earlier process. These are seed bacteria for the earlier process. And it's called activated sludge. So we've gotten rid of carbohydrates now. So what's left? Not much. It's actually pretty clear water. BOD is down 90%. Settable solids are down 90 plus percent. Uh, there's a lot of bacteria in the water though dissolved and that's why we have to chlorinate this water before we release it into a receiving body. And here you see the liquid chlorine tanks which very often have a convoluted path to them so that you can improve the mixing of the tanks and the water. This is a tank, it, this is a uh, chlorine contact tank at Bowery Bay. Rikers Island is in the background and you could see the excessive foaming that's occurring at that tank way down at the end. Of course these tanks are empty, the one on the left is full. So we've done everything we could with the liquid fraction. But what about the solids? Well these have to get thickened, digested, and then disposed of. Let's go through this process. Here's a sludge thickener. Material from the primary and the secondary settling tank get combined into this tank, conical shaped, and the solids fall to the bottom. And they are slowly, gently pushed into a pipe. The solids that go into this pipe are about heavy cream consistency. So it's not really a mud we're looking at but it's got a lot of organic matter in it and of course a lot of fungal and bacterial cells. And this is where the magic occurs. Essentially, solids are collected and concentrated in the thickeners and then they're digested for 60 to 90 days at 37 degrees centigrade, our body temperature, by anaerobic bacteria. Essentially, what's happening in your colon is happening in these tanks. And you know what gases come out from your colon? Well, the same thing here. It's methane, carbon dioxide, and hydrogen sulfide. And that methane is good biogas. So what's going on here is that we have the final sludge after about three months of, of cooking is biologically inert and is ready to be transported, mixed with soil as a uh, a blending agent and conditioning agent and people are literally buying it from New York and other cities. So this is the secondary sewage treatment process. And here's a view from Newtown Creek sewage treatment plant. These by the way are very old slides. They're some of my favorites. Some of these are almost 30 years old but I'm still quite fond of them. Sorry for the graininess. But here we see I'm standing on a digester looking out into a field of settling and aeration tanks. But you probably know this picture as you travel throughout New York, or maybe you've seen it in this form. Yes, these are the very exotic, sci-fi looking digestion tanks of Newtown Creek. And what's going inside of this is exactly what I described earlier. A gentle mixing keeping the material in there for anywhere from two to three months, producing biogas, which is then used as a fuel. But many cultures have discovered this long time ago. If you take chicken feces, human feces, mix it with water, put it in a drum, let it sit out in the sun and get nice and warm, gas will be produced. And ga gas is very often used for cooking in low and middle income countries, especially in Africa where temperatures are perfect for such uh, natural heating. Remember the temperature has to be quite high for this. At least it has to be body temperature. Then the gas is stored and sold to people, but very often it's used right there in the facility because to move all that sewage around you need motors and pumps. So these diesel engines also work on sewer gas. So secondary sewage treatment plant is, uh, design is great because you're actually producing an energy source. Afterwards, the sludge 
is dewatered. Uh, very often, uh, we years ago, we used to just dump this out to sea, then we stopped doing that. But right now, it's dewatered, compre uh, compressed uh, into almost like a sludge cake, and sold away. And today, it's put on rail cars and shipped south and west to sites that need fertilizer. And what you see here is the application of injected sewage sludge into soil as a conditioner and fertilizer, or of course it can be sprayed onto soil. Some of these practices offer risk, but usually can be managed if done appropriately during the right season. Now in New York, we have many sewage treatment plants, and you could see by this uh, map that they're dispersed throughout the city, depending on what community you live in, the sewage will be channeled into the appropriate secondary sewage treatment plant. Okay, I hope you enjoyed the presentation and learned something about how the secondary sewage treatment process works and specifically how New York City handles its uh, sewage treatment uh, operations. Keep in mind that processes change, so some of the information in this video may be out of date or modified, so please bear with me. Okay, be well. Goodbye.